Always. We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? Is that going to He rose quickly from political obscurity, emerging first as a mayoral candidate in Johannesburg and not long afterwards becoming leader of South Africa's main opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, in 2015. Musi Maimani thinks he's got the answers to South Africa's problems. At a time of economic and political turmoil, the ruling African National Congress, he says, is focused less on the needs of the people, more on the enrichment of its ruling elite. Corruption in the ANC is not limited. When he called for a vote in Parliament recently to impeach President Jacob Zuma for breaching the Constitution, Maimani struck a heavy blow in the opposition's campaign to overtake the party that he accuses of betraying the ideals of Nelson Mandela. But the vote failed, and the ANC is fighting back, using the rhetoric of race to discredit Maimani. They call him a sellout, a puppet of the rich, the black face of a white party. Musi Maimani points to his party's successful record in governing the Western Cape province with Cape Town, the jewel at its heart. He believes that with local elections due later this year, the DA will make its mark in some of the country's other big cities. But in the townships outside Cape Town, the poor are getting poorer, much as they are everywhere else in South Africa. What does Musi Maimani have to offer them? Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, we sit down with him in Cape Town. Musi Maimani, thank you for speaking to Al Jazeera. And thank you, it's a great privilege to be here. When you called for a vote in Parliament to impeach President Jacob Zuma after the Constitutional Court found against him for using public money to do up his own home, did you have any realistic expectation of success in a parliament so heavily weighted in favour of the ANC? It's a very important constitutional provision that says that if a president of the republic in section 89 of the constitution violates the constitution, then that president must be impeached. So the first question was never about the numbers in parliament. It was about if you are a true constitutionalist, it's written in such a way that if there's serious violation, serious misconduct, that president must be removed. It then meant that parliament must then, who also in the same judgment, were found against for not being able to apply themselves in a proper manner, consistent with the constitution, that this was the opportunity to do so. And the true test was whether or not ANC MPs would defend the constitution or defend Jacob Zuma. And I felt as leader of the opposition that it was important for me to put that test before them. And when they took the test and then made the decision to say they would defend Jacob Zuma, it then made us realize, and I think it makes South Africans realize, that Project Zuma is not an anomaly to the ANC. It is the ANC itself. And I think that's a very important point to be in in the history of South Africa. So essentially, I mean, you didn't really expect it to pass. It sounds like it was a sort of game, if you like, to expose the ANC, to use the constitutional provisions to expose the failings of the ANC. I, I expected them to stick to the constitution. It was an important you motion. You kind of expected the ANC parliamentarians, parliamentarians en masse to vote against their leader. I would expect them today to answer the question, can they use their majority in parliament to continue to violate the constitution? And I think it's an important question. That they've made their choice doesn't mean gamesmanship. It means, ultimately, that if the ANC does not under, that can undermine the Constitution in that manner, they'll do it in other instances. And that must be a worrying thing for all of us as South Africans. Well, do you not feel that having failed in that vote, or Parliament having failed in that vote to impeach Jacob Zuma, that in effect what's been achieved is the entirely opposite? effect, which is to allow the ANC now to draw a line under this whole affair with President Zuma's power essentially intact. In other words, a strategic error on your part. Far from. It's a pyrrhic victory to use uh, that analysis, firstly. Secondly, the battle is far from over. I think it's important that now we bring a charge against Jacob Zuma to make him recognize 
the fact that A, he's misled parliament, he's been found against. Secondly, every member of the ANC who voted in support of the motion effectively, in our view, broke their constitutional oath. And therefore, that is not, in our view, a strategic error. It's an important milestone. Because I think the error that people have made historically is to make the assumption that if you deal with Jacob Zuma, the ANC can self-correct. It cannot be so. That's why the second part is that you need to, we are in a fairly young democracy in contrast to perhaps maybe other ones in the world. And what is important for people to realize is that in a 21-year-old democracy, we can accelerate the job of educating South Africans about constitutionalism, why it's important to defend it, and that moment accelerated that process. Now, it's up to South Africans who need to answer the next question, which is to say, can they support a movement that cannot defend their constitution? It also means, it opens up section 80 of our constitution that says, a third of the members in the House who are dissatisfied with a particular view that parliament is taking can take parliament on review. So these were then important decisions to be able to take along the way and courts in South Africa are, less, are not inclined or ultimately respect the separation of powers by not getting involved in the running of parliament. And the first question they would have asked us was whether or not did you exhaust all processes in parliament. And I believe in this particular instance we've gone and we are exhausting all processes there. Do you like being described as the Obama of Soweto? Look, you could be described in worse terms. I, I, I think what President Obama did is segue into a, a new form of politics, younger, dynamic. He's uh, certainly one of the youngest presidents in the US and globally so. And I think the comparison comes from a new generation of leaders coming on board. So it's not, it'd be better than be, being compared to him than perhaps maybe someone like Robert. Do you like see Robert, yourself in that light? Like Robert Mugabe or something well, like that. Well, <laughs> do you see yourself in that light? Not at all. I think there are many things. If there's a US president I would maybe choose to celebrate, it would be someone like Bill Clinton, because I think he, you know, just economically took the US in a very important course. But I, I think, you know, the, the challenges in, South, in African politics, when it comes to the skill of communication and being able to politically communicate, often there's almost one style and everybody is cookie cut from that style. And I've certainly wanted to say, surely there must be a different way of communicating that is global, that engages global leaders. So in some ways I've taken some of his oratory skills and asked the question, it communicates to a new generation, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Tell me about your own story. Let's talk about you, Musi Maimani, your rise from the dusty streets of the townships to the great heights of politics. Look, I've had, a, in some ways, a privileged and underprivileged uh, upbringing. I grew up in a home of two parents. My mother worked as a cashier in a, in a uh, supermarket. My father worked in a lock making company on the floors. So in many ways I was, had the privilege of growing up with two parents who were both loving and it's a, it's a privilege I take because I think many South Africans of that era didn't grow up with both parents around. We lived in Soweto for most of our lives. I'm one of four children. You know, my primary school I attended in Dobsonville in Soweto, in a, in a Catholic primary school that back then, during apartheid, forced for a view of education that said it needed to intervene for black kids. And then um, I, I did my high school in public education like uh, many of South Africans. And certainly, in my first political awakening, it's quite coincidental that it takes place during a time such as this one, was because I can recall watching the gunning down of, of Chris Haney and thinking to myself, this is surely not right. Because, you know, if you lived in a world where the meta-narrative was apartheid, but where I grew up, I watched ethnic violence, but I also watched uh, on the news the view that said that this is, was some of the most violent times in the 80s, early 90s. And I certainly, in that way, saw the difficulties of our own country. And it was a key conscientization moment that said, you must do something about this country. It's taken a long time. And it's important for you, isn't it, to emphasize that part of your background 
to contrast, if you like, with the image of the slick, charismatic, well-spoken, well-educated leader that you are. You need to be able to appeal to the masses, to the grassroots. Look, I think my appeal, certainly I've never thought of it in, in I've always thought I'm just an ordinary person. I, I, I lived in the four bedroomed houses that, or four roomed houses that the apartheid government gave to black South Africans under Group Areas Act. I played football, I lived. And I think it's, it's an emphasis because I also don't like to go into a world that says, look, this is, the struggle meant different things for different people. And I'm less inclined, I'm, I'm, I'm equally inclined to say there is a generation of South Africans who perhaps didn't live the majority of their lives under apartheid, but are still feeling its effects today. How do we collectively work with that generation to go forward? So I think for me, the key emphasis must be how do we, I celebrate people like Chris Haney and that generation and ask the question, surely there must be a generational shift of new leaders who are then inclined to take South Africa forward. And so not all of us can hark back to the struggle. We honor it, but we also recognize the fact that I think what South Africa needs today is leaders who can answer the, the more tougher economic questions about the prospect of tomorrow. What is it that you bring as a party and as a leader which is different, unique, distinct, because the main issues that you talk about, unemployment, poverty, inequality, important as they are, are the same issues that the ANC talks about. In fact, you've been accused of wanting to build a party that is an alternate ANC rather than an alternative to the ANC. Isn't it important to bring something unique to the table rather than just poke holes in the policies and record of the ANC? I think we must never forget the fact that the ANC is ideologically incoherent. In one sense, the ANC talks left but walks right. And so when you talk about the distinction to the ANC, I think we must get to a point that we ends, we're honest about what the two contrasts are. And for our offer, firstly, we stand quite clearly in saying that we must make a small, effective and capable state. Now we've proven that where we govern, so the test is on how effective that is. And the ANC believes in a fairly big, cumbersome, socialist, leftist type ideological place. So that's the first contrast. The second is we stand quite strongly on a market-based economy. The ANC can't claim that fact. It's not their space to play in. Now, we've certainly been supportive of micro-enterprise. The revolution in South Africa must be about how do you put equity into the hands of South Africans so that they can be able to trade and create businesses. Thirdly, and it might seem very similar to the ANC, but it's a departure. It's becoming more and more a point of departure for, the, for something that the ANC has departed from. The ideals of non-racialism. Now, it can't just be non-racialism in the way perhaps it was first orchestrated, that yes, we are a rainbow nation. But it must be non-racialism that acknowledges that we have a history where black South Africans have been impoverished. Therefore, I don't hold the view of nationalization in the sense that the state must be the response to that. I rather say, let's put equity and shares into the hands of ordinary South Africans. Let's have a program in this country that says, let's give decent education, equity to black South Africans so that we can empower South Africans to be able to compete. That non-racial offer has been something the ANC has departed from. And then the obvious contrasts work themselves out. The ANC now's primary brand is actually corruption. Ours is to say that we separate party and state so we don't practice cater deployment. We're quite clear in our heads that, in fact, we will have no tolerance for corruption. That's why in any environment, you can test any of our governments, there has been no sense of corruption. And then lastly, I think we've become innovative as a party to focus on young people, the impact of young people, what programs we put towards young people, young people's education. And I think to me, that becomes a crucial issue. You raise frequently the DA's record in the Western Cape and Cape Town as an example of good governance. And you talk there about the youth and your particular appeal for the youth. Well, we spoke, we have spoken to young people. One in particular 
said to us yesterday that you have a credibility problem, the DA, because on the one hand you point to Cape Town as the example of your ability to govern Cape Town in the eyes of this young person, uh, and he said his generation is an example of contrast where the rich nestle in the suburbs and the city and the extremely poor are forgotten in the townships as they are, as they are everywhere. And that that contrast is the reason why he will never vote for the DA, because to him that proves that you're no better than anyone else. No, I think that young person must also recognise the fact that the chances, his chances, his or her chances of being able to find work in the Western Cape are better than anywhere else. Unemployment across the country is now sitting in certain provinces on a broad definition of unemployment, 34% in certain places getting closer to 40% if you get to Limpopo. When you sit here in the Western Cape, you realize the fact that we are starting to get below the national norm. So the chances of that young person, and perhaps maybe there may not be an appreciation now, there will be an appreciation when they start looking for work, which is an important distinction. The second issue is the fact that that same young person will get a better education here than they would anywhere else. Often, that same young person doesn't maybe have an appreciation of what the contrast But this are. is a legacy that you've inherited as a party, isn't Absolutely. it? I mean, the Western Cape is one of the richest provinces in the country with a population far smaller than, let's, let's say, Gauteng. You have inherited a very nice deck of cards here and a very nice hand to play in the Western Cape. It's far not far. all down to the far record far. of the DA. I think we must also remember the fact that the ANC governed in this province. And when they governed, the statistics were starting to look different. With the same deck of cards, unemployment was rising, corruption was on the rise, and opportunities for young people were declining. We had to take over that government, create capacity within it, and reverse those trends. So today, young people in the Western Cape have got access to ICT better than anywhere else. And so, yes, it's not perfect. It's far from. I'll be the first one to admit that. And on the apartheid spatial legacy that you describe, to say that, yeah, white people live here, black people live here, of course it's not. It's an inherited legacy of South Africa. There are multiple ways you can address that inequality. Of course, one of them is about economic growth, and the economic output of the Western Cape is better than anywhere else in the country. So we are already working towards that. We recognize that it's going to be a long-term journey. But we furthermore acknowledge the fact that we've got to address the inequality born out of education. That's why in, in quintile five schools, so the poorest schools, and quintile four schools, the poorest schools, we've invested substantially to make sure that amongst black South Africans, they get the best education in, the, in this province than they would get anywhere else in the country. In taking on a party like the ANC in South Africa, you can expect a pretty stern fight back. This is a 105-year-old party of liberation held in incredibly high esteem by generations in this country, passed on from generation to generation, and they are indeed fighting back. They're fighting back against you on a race basis, portraying you as a sellout and as a puppet of what is essentially a white party, the previous leaders, of course, having been white. How do you respond to that? You know, that's why when we started earlier on about constitutionalism, and you say the ANC has departed from that, one of the things that the ANC has departed from is a basic freedom, which is a freedom of association. They fail to recognize the fact that it's possible that black South Africans can join any party that they so choose. They've departed from that. The second thing the ANC has departed from is what I believe the generation of 1956 that was led by President Nelson Mandela that said that they were fighting a system, not a race. And if you are fighting a system, you recognize the fact that black and white can join together to fight a system that oppresses black people. Even though the same white people were benefiting, they could join arms with black people and fight against it. They've forgotten that that was the fabric of our society. And that today, when you are building a party, I'm not building a party that is black. I'm building a party for all South Africans, regardless of race, who recognize the fact that their fundamental job is to fight for the marginalized, who in this instance are black. So I think if I could 
I, I'm, I'm not in the business of even fighting against the ANC. It's fighting for that vision that was articulated by Nelson Mandela. Here's what you said, racism on race. Racism is evil and we must condemn it. But it cannot be that if you are white and you don't agree with the ANC, you're called a racist. And if you are black, you're called a sellout. Now, increasingly, there's a portion of the electorate in this country, the young, primarily, who neither want the ANC nor the vision of the DA, who are looking for something different, something radical, and they're getting it from the economic freedom fighters from Julius Malema. He's a threat to you, isn't he? Any opposition party is a threat to our own growth. But he uh, is particularly, because he's selling the message that is new. He's selling the message essentially that you can't because you're too much a part of conventional politics and political thinking. No, populism. He's departed entirely from that script. But one of the things that has happened is that he's joined the slipstream of populism. So fraught with a whole lot of other ironies, such as the fact that he has a party that's policy position does not support the constitution, yet they are. But that doesn't to matter to the, the voters. Does it? That matters in this context, of where we talk in of front of it, cameras it will, or in it, parliament, but not to the voters. What it will matter is if should the EFF win any council and then see how well they govern there, because that will matter. Populist movements globally, and I, and I think we've seen this, they rise up in a sway of emotion and then often fall in the same pace. Mm. So, so yes, it's a threat in the short term, mm. but in the long run, our view says that we will outstrip it. And even now, as voters are starting to test us for what it is, are trusting us more and more, and our growth as a proportion. Mm. Well, you say that, but you may have an additional problem to the EFF, or perhaps because of the EFF. A recent poll by New World Wealth suggests that the DA with you as its leader may be losing its essential support base. More than three quarters of respondents said that they would vote for the ANC if Cyril Ramaphosa was its leader. He may take over, of course, in time. Only 8% said that they would vote for the DA with you as its leader. Isn't no, that a problem? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what the sampling of that particular poll is. 650 we have, we have our own polling mechanism that is, in fact, affirming that our traditional base has come with us. Because, because remember, Perhaps maybe the history of the DA was born out of a balancing between the hopes of the majority and the fears of the minority. My legacy says, and the work that I'm working towards is to say, we must build a party that says, can we see a collective vision without trying to do this balancing act? And therefore, yes, along the way, there will be South Africans, as I've noticed, there are some South Africans who say to me, you're pursuing this vision, it isn't consistent with me, but it's a vision that is inclusive. It's a vision that says the DA must be that alternative. It must be that vision that carries on Mandela's legacy, but understands the fact that we've got a country to run. Local elections coming up, the next general election in 2019. Isn't it the reality, therefore, that the DA uh, is unlikely to come to power in 2019? That's most unlikely to happen that if anyone is likely to make serious inroads into the ANC support base, it's probably the EFF. There may then be a resurgent ANC under a new leader that you will have to, count, that you will have to counter as well, and therefore even 2024 would be in question for you. I want to ask you, in that context, whether you're open for, to coalition talks with perhaps the likes of the EFF. We must understand that the global order is a world of coalition politics. I would be the first one to acknowledge that. How that coalition works then becomes an important one. I think the untold story is about the fact that the ANC is not a sustainable project. There are two types of ANC. The ANC people who are more EFF aligned in that they don't support property rights, they believe in nationalization. And there are ANC people who perhaps see the constitution and a market-based economy. Now, when you talk about coalitions, I don't always think that we should pursue a vision that says it should just be the following parties coming together. I think South Africa 
may undergo a realignment of politics where people who share common values come together in pursuit of a particular goal rather than the classical, let's just merge the following parties. But you accept the basic premise that you've got to come together with somebody to have any realistic chance of governing. And I think it's becoming more and more. I think even the ANC cannot be guaranteed of an outright majority going forward. I think they will face the same problem. Otherwise, if South Africa... But they've got natural parties, par uh, partners. They're already in a coalition. If, if the ANC believes, even with their natural partners, that, that they will continue to have this commanding 60% majority over the two elections that you are citing, I think it's a misnomer. I think they will suffer the same ideals where they need coalition partners along the way, even in the current setup. So yes, that is the question, but my project is a realignment. It's a realignment of saying we can form part of a national government with a number of multiple partners, so long as we agree on values and we agree on the way forward. Musi Maimani, thank you so much, much appreciated. for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you so much.